Welcome to the Trade Up Podcast, Episode 7. I'm Lisa Brandt. This time, John Finan, owner of Finan Home Service and co author of the book Trade Up, talks about some decisions being made by the Ontario Labour Minister, how a shortage of tradespeople hits the customer in the wallet, how the Greater London area is looking forward to a boom in manufacturing and industrial jobs. We get a little philosophical about empathy in the workplace, and we start with the positives and the negatives of the FAST program. FAST stands for Focused Apprenticeship Skills Training. It starts in Ontario high schools this fall. Students who want a career in the trades will be able to spend up to 80% of their time training and 20% on academics. Here's John Finan. You know, I'm not an expert on whether 80% uh, hands-on, 20% schooling makes any sense. But I will tell you this, that the reason we send people to school is so that they're job ready. So the faster we can get them job ready at an age that's acceptable and we've decided it's 18, I'm all for it. And any new program, and I, as soon as I heard you say the acronym for FAST, I thought, okay, what uh, what group of people sat around for two days trying to make those words match up with FAST because it's, you know, it matches too well. So my sense will be this program, like a lot of programs, is going to have some messiness in the beginning and it's going to have some problems that will need to be corrected. And unfortunately, because it falls into the political realm, it's going to have a lot of critics that aren't there because they want to make it better. They just want to criticize. So, But when I think about it generally, I think I see two issues that could happen. And I will admit, I don't know all of the nuances when it comes to what extra post-secondary uh, education you can get into if you've gone this way. But let's just say you're a, you're a 15, 16 year old high school student and you decide, I want a career in the trades. The first thing is you still have a curfew. You probably still have to be home by 10 o'clock. We don't let you drive cars. We don't let you in the army. There's lots of things we don't let you do. And here we're allowing you, promoting and, and counseling you to make this decision in how you're going to spend the rest of your life working, which aside from your spouse and how you treat your body is probably, you know, those are the three holy grail things you need to think about. So I'm not so sure that's wise to do it that way if we've set them up for a situation where they can't transition into post-secondary university courses afterwards. You know, I'm a, I'm a proponent of education and lifelong learning. And if somebody decides at the age of 33, after having a 15-year career in the trades, that they want to transition into something else and they want to go to university, if the first thing they have to do is finish high school, that's just one barrier that they shouldn't have to do. And, it, you know, if I could say anything the program should have is it should have a way to equal you out. And, you know, I'm a fan of all these economic levers we have. And, uh, you know, if somebody starts in the trade, that's wonderful. But maybe part of getting their certificate of qualification as, say, a plumber, they also have to finish grade 12. You know, right now the bar is set, I think, a grade 10 education to be into the trades, which quite honestly is enough math and science for you to get through that program. But, you know, if somebody is a, a third or fourth term apprentice and they know they can't finish their trades qualification unless they finish all of the high school credits that are required should they choose to go to university, that should be part of it. That should be part of the levers we use to make sure that they're ready. It's a good point you make about a university education because uh, this has come up recently with a couple of people I know, not necessarily even with skilled trades, but just the fact that they want to transition to something. For goodness sake, I'm a freelance writer as part of what I do for a living, and a lot of places want a BA for a freelance writer in a certain genre. And I don't have that. So I'm automatically out. I have 30 some years of experience, but that's not as good as the degree. We've developed ourselves into a credential society. So you need credentials for things. And it starts at a very young age. So, you know, there's high schools in this in the in the city that you need to qualify to go to. You need to do certain mm -hmm. things. So if you want to go to a dancing or musical school, you have to show an aptitude and, and an interest that uh, that aligns with that. And then as you're getting through high school, all universities ask not just for your marks, but they want to know what you've been doing outside of school. And my guess would be that part-time jobs are important. I was on the, you know, the robotics club. I was on the football team. I was on the high school student council. These sorts of things are all these credentials that young people are having. And is it important not to get a BA? It's not. But it is important if the average student applying has got seven of them, these extracurricular activities, and you only have two. 
So you need to have seven or nine. And this is what goes on with the BA. So when they look at a pool of applicants for the writing jobs that you're thinking of that require a BA, it's only because, well, let's just weed the pool out. Let's just weed it out. We'll just say this is what you need, not because it makes any sense, but because it just makes our job easier. And honestly, we're all guilty of it in some fashion in our life, so it's not wrong in that sense. But it is the reality, and you better be ready for it. And I don't think that there's a a 50-year-old out there that just hasn't seen that traumatic shift happen in their life because they or somebody that they were very close to just wasn't prepared for interest rates to go to a crazy 7% and they can't afford, you know, we all know it's happening. When you get to our age, you know, these things are going to happen. You need to prepare for it. So when you're a 20 year old or a 16 year old, and you're thinking you're going to become a plumber and that's all you're going to do for your whole life, somebody needs to give you a shake and say, that's not likely how it's going to go. You might want to change or you might be forced to change and you better be prepared for it because you know what? The world does not care when you're 35 years old. Future proof yourself a little bit, yeah, right? That's right. We, of course, discussed the importance of tradespeople and they are important. One of the things that we're finding, a report came out about how the lack of people replacing people who are retired, like just the lack of people, we need more people in the trades, is affecting the economy and specifically like a household economy when somebody wants to get a tradesperson in to do something, how it costs so much more. As a person who owns a company that employs tradespeople, are you finding that that's the case as well? You know, I've been doing this for 30 years. And if I went right back to the beginning when I started my business, my very first customer probably used my services because I undercut the other guy. And so, you know, in some sense, it's it's always been that way. And when I think about it from the customer standpoint, I think about it this way, particularly if something's broken. Now, let's just use a refrigerator, for instance. I have a refrigerator and it's not cooling as much as I need. So I have a repair person come in and let's say I spend $300 to have that fridge repaired. All I have for my 300 bucks is the same thing that I had two days ago when it worked properly. It's not freezing better than it ever was. It's not new. It's not going to last any longer. It just costs me 300 bucks to keep it where it was, right? So in some sense, it's kind of like putting gas in the car and we never like to do that. I just, you know, at least with gas in the car, you get to go somewhere you weren't at before, but with the fridge, you're in the same spot. It didn't move. It's still you know, doesn't hold the magnets on or whatever scratches on it or squeak it's got. So, you know, in some sense, the customer's always frustrated about that regardless of the price. But I will say from the from the contractor's point of view, particularly when it comes to, to service work, like going to people's homes or businesses and repairing something, finishing that job, going off to the next one and doing it in a timely manner, it is an extremely difficult thing to plan out equally. And I think about it this way. The average person that works for most companies wants to work 40 hours a a week and they want to work between, say, 8 o'clock and 4 o'clock. They don't want to work weekends. They don't want to work nights. And they want to work the same amount of hours every week because their bills are somewhat consistent. So things need to break down 40 hours a week between Monday and Friday. And it's just not the way the world works. So, you know, from the service point of view, contractors and, and a lot of times tradespeople would much prefer to be on a larger construction project where, okay, they're going to start digging a hole for this uh, 15-story building, and we're going to get the plumbing contract. We're going to be in there on the 1st of May, and the building is uh, due to be occupied the 1st of May next year. So what we know is we've got 12 months of work where you can go there at 8 o'clock, you can work till 4 o'clock, and you can do that for the next 12 months. So why in God's green earth am I actually doing service work sometimes, I think to myself, when we could be on these large construction projects and just doing it all the time, making a little bit less money per hour worked, but there's 40 hours of work, less headaches, less customers to deal with, less trucks to deal with moving around the city, less people to collect money from and all of those sorts of things. So it's a little bit of a yin and yang, and it's just not surprising. And I think at the end of the day, we all just have to get used to how much things are costing or opt out of those things. Well, everything costs more. Everything does. yeah. Right. Everything costs more right now. I mean, you want to eat? And these projects that you're talking about, for example, going on a residential project, there aren't as many of them going on right now either, are there? Yeah, that's true. And that, you know, that in some ways speaks to my point about why a a person going through this fast high school program would want to make sure they're ready to go to university because every industry goes through cycles and the construction industry is absolutely no different. There are certain times when we're way beyond busy. We can't do everything that needs to be done. And then there's other times when, hey, maybe interest rates are high, maybe 
housing starts aren't where they need to be and there's a little bit of a lull. What I think, at least in uh, in the residential construction side right now is happening is that we're moving away from the single family homes with the eight acre lot. You know, we're not building streets and putting 100 homes on them anymore. We're taking a lot and we're putting a, a three to 15 story building on it. And that's where people will be living, much like they do in every other part of the world where we don't have these massive properties with all these big houses, with lots of washrooms and all the things that Lisa, you and I grew up thinking that we wanted and and worked hard to achieve. Younger people these days are saying, you know, you sold your soul to do that, and I'm not sure that I want to do it. And honestly, at a million dollars for a for a single family house, they probably can't afford it either. So they're saying, you know what, why don't I get something smaller? And the transition is is going towards these multifamily residential complexes, which I think is a good thing because it'll make the whole industry a little bit more consistent on a day-to-day basis. There was a study, an employment study um, on manufacturing jobs, uh, industrial employers in the London area. And London is one of the hottest regions in Ontario. So they were talking about the Volkswagen plant in St. Thomas, up to 3,000 people. And then the spinoff from that, manufacturing jobs. You know, we always hear about companies that are shutting down or people getting downsized. But this sounds like some good news for the region. Yeah, I think it's it's absolutely wonderful, and and you know economics, um, uh, good times travel all over the world and all over our country constantly. It's just our time in London, and from everything that I've been seeing, I think uh, the next ten years are going to be a boom time here, not just because something like the Volkswagen plant is coming, but because we're moving off of fossil fuels. Whether you agree with climate change or not, it almost doesn't matter. The economy is going to boom as we move from heating our homes with gas uh, and cars with uh, with gas to electricity. It's going to do nothing but improve our area. And I have to give kudos to uh, to both levels of government, probably even the municipal government. They worked really hard to make sure that our region is attractive. We've got lots of land. We're actively out there searching for for businesses to, to come into our area and grow. And um, if you look at the cost of living for houses in London compared to some of the other major spots in the country, wonderful spot. I mean, you and I have both lived in this area most of our lives. Absolutely love it. I like to go to Toronto. I like to go to big cities and visit. But honestly, we were in London, England, visiting my sister-in-law recently. And uh, she has got a place that is in a beautiful area. But you take the, they call it the tube. You take the tube everywhere. You're in a big city. And, uh, you know, they love it. They've been there for 30 years. And I'm sure they're going to stay there forever. It's not for me. And London is that opportunity that uh, other cities aren't. What we get the most feedback about on this podcast is talking about women in trades. And some people think it's great. They want to hear more about it because uh, we do need more women in in skilled trades. Others say, I'm already a woman in skilled trades. And why are you talking about this is not a thing. One of the studies I was reading recently echoed studies that have been coming out for years and years and years saying that men are less empathetic than women. And that is one of the issues that happens on the job site. And does it come as a surprise? We all have our strengths. We all have uh, the way we operate. You're from Mars. I'm from Venus or whichever way it goes. I don't know how it is. But do you see empathy or these sort of soft skills that women have being an issue on either side when we're trying to work together on a trade site? Certainly, there's going to be conflict. My first thought is, I can't believe that they actually paid to do a study to find out that men are less empathetic than women. I mean, this is something Again. that every, everybody has known. <laughs> women have known it about men. Men have known it about women. This is not a secret. And quite honestly, it's probably the reason that intimate relationships between men and women thrive to the degree they do, because we bring something different to the table. That changes, though, when we get into a construction site or we get into a work environment where the relationship has changed, right? You just, you know, might be five guys working with uh, 27 women, 27 guys working with five women. There's going to be some dynamics between guys Mm -hmm. on each other because let's face it, we like to find out what the hierarchy is with the other guys in the room all the time. And this has never changed since we were little boys. And we just have to admit that that's the way it's going to go. So I think it is going to be something that needs to be worked through. And the way it gets worked through, you know, there's this old saying is that, you know, I don't spend a lot of time with my kids say, but I have quality time. You can't have quality time without quantity time. That's how everything gets solved. So when there's more women on the job sites, will this problem get better? 
Absolutely it will, because there will be more conflict, which means there will be more resolutions, which means we'll find out what works, what doesn't work, and everybody will find that happy medium. But we're in that time now where the ratios are awful between men and women on construction sites. And until that changes, there's going to be some sort of conflict, whether it's overt or covert. I suspect that a lot of women that when they get onto a construction site, they feel a lot more prejudiced against than they truly are. And I would say that's not a factor of men being prejudiced against women on job sites. It's just a fact that men are prejudiced against everybody they're working with. We're constantly challenging each other. We're constantly pushing each other. We're constantly trying to make ourselves seem a little bit better than they are and make the other person seem a little bit worse than they are. You know, it's kind of how we sort things out. You know, as the group gets a little bit of synergy, then we start to to work together as a team. But when somebody's new you know, you're getting challenged. Right. And so if it was me coming onto a construction site, I would want to be told, oh, that was a great job. And all that kind of stuff. And the guys might not have time for that. And that's just not how they operate. Right. But I'd want to be, I'd want some atta girls. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah. 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 Well, I, this is just my thought. I'm going to say that probably men will do that more with women than they would do with each other. And it's not that we don't have time to do it. It's just that why would I tell you, you did a good job? I want to tell you you did a bad job. I want to motivate you by kicking you in the butt, not patting you on the head. And that's not right. Like at my age, I don't actually do that anymore. That's not how you sort of go through life. Once you get to, you know, somebody that's in their 40s, 50s and 60s, you kind of get to a level where you're not doing it. But let's face it, we're talking about 18 to 35 year old testosterone filled men that are trying to make their way in the world, figure out how they go. And this is a behavior that comes out and uh, it's not likely to change. What we can't accept, though, is that overt behavior where if somebody says something that's inappropriate to a woman, if somebody acts in a way that isn't right, you know, that needs to be stopped. Ninety five percent of the guys on the job site would say, yeah, that's not right. But are we going to make it any easier on anybody? No, we're not. Right. And that's part of the attraction of getting into it as well. The labor minister for the province now says requiring menstrual products on large construction sites will help encourage more women to look to the trades for a career. They also want to get rid of the sick note requirement and a few other things. But that was the one that kind of caught my attention. Again, he says large construction sites, so I don't know how much that would change things. We already have to have a separate washroom for women, right, on those bigger sites. Yeah. What the definition of bigger is, I'm not entirely sure. And what a separate washroom means, I'm not sure. You know, my hope would be that when I first heard that, I don't know, two, three years ago, I thought, well, why? You know, only one person goes in at a time. They're all disgusting. What does it matter? And then I went, you know, if I was a woman, would I want to go into a into a porta potty that's got a urinal there? I mean, I'm not using it. It's really close to where I'm going to be sitting. And I wouldn't. And if I was, you know, if, it, if the tables were turned and women had two dispensaries for whatever, uh, I would not want to be in that one. I would choose to use the men's only one that had just what I needed. So, you know, the same with the menstrual product thing. We provide so much, whether it's a, an indoor work facility, whether it's a construction site, job sites, uh, as, as well as offices will have bathrooms and sinks and towels and soap. And many of them will have showers, they'll have toilets, they'll have cleaning people that come in and clean them, and they're going to have toilet paper. So if you connect all of those dots, does it really seem odd that we would put menstrual products in there? doesn't at all. It just seems natural. Like, why wouldn't they be there? Most offices would have aspirin and some other things for people that maybe come to work and don't have an aspirin with them. So why wouldn't we have that? So I think it's a wonderful thing. I will say, though, that if at any point the government thinks that we will get more women into the trade by doing this, yeah. they're mistaken. What they're going to get is political points for this. And maybe they should get some because the only way legislation comes out is when the government does something about it. So I think from that perspective, it's a good thing, but they're not going to move the needle one iota. There's no woman that's going to say, Hey, I want to quit my job in an office, or I want to, you know, finish high school and become a plumber so that I can go onto a job site now that they have menstrual products. It's just fantasy. No, you're absolutely right. But it is a sign that they're thinking about women and thinking about how women operate. And having been a woman all of my life, John, I can tell you that if you need one of those things, you know, if you're 
everybody can watch the calendar. Everybody can be as organized and, and prepared as they are. Everybody makes mistakes. And, and so if there is a moment when you need one of those products and it's been made available to you, it's, it's everything. So it's just, I think, a little bit of a signal that, hey, you know, we, we've got you gals in mind. I think one of the things that that would make that that has has brought that up, Lisa, would be exactly what we want, which is there's starting to be a, more talk about getting women into the trades, which has started the dialogue, which has actually probably brought out some of the women that have been in the trades that go, hey, I've been doing this for a while. And you're right. It's a great job. Um, it's not all the things that you think it wasn't. And uh, I would want more uh, women to get into the trades and they're sharing their stories. And their voice is being heard in a way that gives them the credibility to be listened to. And I'll give you an example of the shift I had. And it was so long ago, I don't remember. But London had a professional baseball team come here a number of years ago. And they were going to call themselves, they were called the London Werewolves. Do you remember those days? They played at Labatt Park. And, and the, you know, the young guy that brought the team the here. Rippers. Did a, yeah, the Rippers, right. Yeah, well, ha, there you go. They weren't the Rippers because the Rippers was, Jack the Ripper was going to be their mascot. And there was a massive outcry from uh, women in the community that said, we can't name our team after a famous murder that went around and, and killed women. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, well, that's not what I think about when I think about the London Ripper. The Ripper's a famous character, and why wouldn't we name it that? And the first lady that came on the radio to talk about it explained her story, and I didn't buy it. I did not buy it. And then another woman got on who I knew and respected, and she said, not word for word, but she said the exact same thing. She just said it a different way. And I went, got it. Rippers are gone. Werewolves are better. So yeah. and I went, you know what? It's just how the message came out. The first uh, person that talked about it was more confrontational in the way she described it. The next one was just describing the story. And I went, yeah, I understand that. I hear the empathy. And I think the same thing with the menstrual products and the bathrooms. You know, the way the story is being portrayed is really how we receive it. Right. Tell the story well, I guess. But your empathy can be uh, can be boosted with the right message. Look at you. Absolutely. And, you know, fair enough. It comes with age, too, right? You know, we <laughs> see my position, you know, after having a company for 30 years is really to listen to my customers. I have to listen to my staff. I have to look for the best interests of the company. And those things aren't always aligned in the same way. So I have to balance those things off. So it comes with age for sure. It comes with the job that I have, which is listening to all sides and making a decision that hopefully is a wise one. One you know. of these days, I'll stop looking for out of girls. So, you know, we can all go. <laughs> well, I will say, Lisa, that I'm never going to say out of girl to any woman. <laughs> and out of woman doesn't roll off my tongue. I'm going to say good job. That's probably the best I'm going to do. Thanks for listening to the Trade Up Podcast. If you have any feedback or an idea for a terrific guest, email John, john at tradeupbook.ca. If you know someone who's thinking about their future career, the Trade Up Book offers a peek into the lives of apprentices and tradespeople. You can find out more about it on our website, tradeupbook.ca. Thanks for listening from John Finan and me, Lisa Brandt.